time to start. So good morning and welcome to the machine learning coffee seminar. So, so today we will have a presentation from Nikki Loppi from NVIDIA and Lucas Prediger from Aalto University's Department of Computer Science. And they will be talking about optimizing differentially private learning for GPUs. And then the speakers welcome all questions already in, in the middle of the presentation. So if you have a question, so please use the raise hand option or then you can also write your question to the chat box and I, I will then take care of the questions. But so please, the floor is yours, Nikki and Lucas. All right, thanks very much, Laura. So yeah, hi everyone, my name is Nikki and I am a solutions architect at NVIDIA and I'm based here in Helsinki. And more specifically, I'm part of the NVIDIA AI Technology Center team and I'm responsible for the academic collaborative projects happening between NVIDIA and FKI under this NVIDIA AI Technology Center program. So today, Lucas and I like to present our work on optimizing differentially private learning for GPUs. And this was one of the first pilot projects that was conducted under this NVIDIA AI Technology Center program. So before going to the actual technical talk, I would like to just briefly summarize what we do here in Finland with the NVIDIA AI Technology Center. So NVAITC, the high level object of the center is to catalyze AI transformation through research centric engagement. And the idea originated from Singapore and there are multiple different NVAITC sites in Asia, as well as in Australia. And recently we've launched also three centers here in Europe, so one in Italy, one in Luxembourg, and then also, yeah, obviously in Finland. And here's kind of our operational model here in Finland. So the main idea is to create this kind of positive feedback loop where we try to enable academic researchers to do their research more efficiently by leveraging our technology stack. This would allow them, the academics, to scale their research to the National Supercomputing Center facilities to, to using CSC's supercomputers. And this would hopefully then make CSC to value our platform, not only in terms of like hardware, but also software, so the entire CUDA ecosystem. And obviously then it's wider adoption allows us to do this kind of collaborative work. Finally, <clears throat> what's characteristic about NVIDIA Technology Center is that this kind of technology enablement is done by a collaborative academic project. And the project that we'll be talking about today is a prime example of what we can do under this center. And we have a website under fki.fi slash nvaitc. And there you have all the information, contact, de contact details, as well as then instructions, how to submit projects if you're interested in collaborating with us. So please talk to your PIs, please reach out to us. And yeah, I look forward to hearing from many of you regarding these kind of collaborative work opportunities. So without further ado, let's start with the talk. I will be talking later on in the presentation, but for now, I'll pass the mic over to Lucas. Thanks very much. Yes, great. Thanks, Nikki. And then I guess we should look into switching the screen sharing. And am I now sharing properly? Yes, you are. Yes. Okay, great. So yeah. Um, okay, yeah, I'm Lucas and I will now be talking, basically setting the stage for and introducing the project we were working on and which we then uh, jointly worked on with the NVATC. So now I will giving a broad overview of the project we have and then Nikki will later talk about the uh, actual optimization work he did for us or with us rather. So allow me to first briefly introduce me and uh, where I'm working. So for those that maybe don't see the webcam that well, there's a picture of me. I'm a PhD student at Aalto University and I am part of a research group of roughly 10 people, both from the University of Helsinki and Aalto University, which is jointly headed by professors Antti Honkela and Samuel Kaski. And what we are doing is we are researching privacy-preserving machine learning methods as part of the FCAI research program for 
And my focus in particular in this group is on differentially private probabilistic modeling and synthetic data generation. So what is this all about? Um, I brought a little comic for you and there you can see this kind of presumably some kind of state agent who is probing a text prediction model by typing in long live the revolution. Our next meeting will be at, and then this model based on the previous inputs it saw predicts the next meeting location and time of when the revolution members will meet. And while this is of course a bit euphemistic, it's uh, like a nice uh, illustration of how these models do pick up on maybe private details in the training data. So here it's just memorization of what the model has seen before, but there's also more subtle ways in which more subtle ways in which machine learning machine learning models do pick up on sensitive data that it sees during training. And then an attacker who gets hold on the model can probe it to reveal some of the sensitive information. And that's of course a problem because it means that we have to take special care whenever we are working with sensitive training data. So one way to prevent this and what we are mostly looking at is differential privacy machine learning. And that basically means or gives us a guarantee that for any specific training data item, uh, the probability of training a machine learning model on the training data with this item, uh, the probability there of obtaining some output is roughly the same as without this particular training item. So basically, um, I can take out any, take out or include any particular training data item without actually changing the output very much, which uh, gives us a guarantee that the output does not depend too much on any particular training data item. More formally, uh, this is the mathematical way it is defined. So if we have a randomized training algorithm A, we call it epsilon delta differential private. If for all pairs of adjacent data sets D and D prime and adjacent here means they differ in exactly one of the data items they contain. And for every subset of possible outputs, the probability um, of obtaining some output under uh, from the training algorithm trained on the data set D is bounded around the same probability using training set D prime. Uh, it's bounded multiplicatively uh, with E to the epsilon and additively by a this plus delta. So epsilon and delta are just mathematical knobs we have with which we can tune how much private privacy we want to have or how similar the output distribution should be for training sets differing in only one item. And again, this means that if, uh, for, if, if I am a data subject and have sensitive training data, I can then have the guarantee that if I give my data to someone training a machine learning model under different differential privacy, it won't screw the result very much. So this is what we are aiming for and what we are actively researching. And of course, then we need some tools to work with. So what we need is a flexible implementation of this differential private learning. And in our case for probabilistic inference, and of course, we would like it to be simple to use. It should be easily extendable for new research directions so that we can tweak it to whatever we want to research in particular. And of course, it should be performant and fast because we don't want to wait ages for every inference we do. But unfortunately, there are not so many easy to use framework implementations readily available. This has actually changed a tiny bit in the recent month, but still most of the tools are somewhat in their infancy. And it also turned out that integrating differential privacy into existing machine learning frameworks is surprisingly tricky. So we wanted to uh, do this once and have a solution with on which we can then build um, yeah, our, our research implementations. So why is, is it so surprisingly tricky? I will go into a bit 
detail on that. And actually, conceptually, it is relatively simple. Most of the methods we use depend on stochastic gradient descent. And turning that into a differentially private version is actually fairly simple because we can just take the gradient update and add some noise to it. So in more specifically, we add zero centered Gaussian noise to it. And the variance of this noise depends on uh, basically two factors. One is here denoted with sigma and is determined from the desired privacy level, uh, as you recall, which is parameterized by this epsilon and delta. So the smaller these are and the more privacy we want, the more noise we add here. And this also depends on the number of iterations we do in the stochastic gradient descent. So this is basically the sigma captures only our goal of how much privacy we want to add. And then this C parameter here is in essence a measure of the sensitivity of the algorithm to the training data. So it captures uh, for each data item the largest difference it makes basically in the training. So how sensitive is the algorithm to seeing any particular data item. And here in practice is just the maximum norm of the gradient of each data instance. And that of course can be unbounded, which wouldn't be very good for adding noise in this case. So in practice, what we do is that we designate C as a clipping threshold for the norm of the per instance gradient. So whenever we see a per instance gradient that exceeds this uh, norm, we clip it down to this maximum value, which gives us a finite upper bound for this. But of course, doing this means that we need access to the per instance gradients to do this clipping. And that's where most of the established machine learning frameworks fail us because they only give us batch gradients and no access to per instance gradients. What we also need for all of this to actually be true is that we need to do true subsampling of mini batches. So the usual approach of just uh, forming your iterative process as epochs, where in each epoch you subdivide the whole training data set into batches and then iterate over those. That is not sufficient to guarantee different privacy. We need to do in every iteration, we need to truly subsample a mini batch from the whole set of data. So those are the two constraints we have that are a bit different from regular machine learning frameworks and that we needed to implement. And we then did so in NumPyro and JAX. So NumPyro is just a Pyro-like probabilistic framework, which is based on JAX. So that was our yeah, front end in that sense that we needed to have probabilistic programming uh, functionality. And then the uh, more interesting part of this is our choice of JAX, which is a highly performant and flexible computation framework for NumPy, which is based on the transformation of pure functions. So basically, you can define all the computations you want to do in something that looks very much like NumPy and uh, formulate the, uh, the, the operations you need to do as functions without side effects, and then use JAX to transform these fun functions into uh, other stuff. So the, the transformations that are available is first the just-in-time compilation to XLA primitives. So that's the backend that also TensorFlow uses for fast CPU and GPU computation. Uh, JAX also gives us auto differentiation of functions and comprehensive function vectorization capabilities. And if we focus on these three features, uh, the solution to our problem is kind of apparent. We just vectorize this automatic differentiation over the mini batch and thus obtain the per instance gradients, which we then, of course, can clip, sum them up, and add the DP noise. And voila, there we have our differentially private SGD. So we did so, and then we uh, wanted to see how well is this doing. And for small models, so roughly less, less than 100 parameters, we observe no notice, noticeable performance impact, which of course is very nice. However, for a larger model, which in our case was a variational autoencoder on the MNIST data set, and it had roughly 700,000 parameters, 
we observed a significant increase in training time by a factor of 33. So training one epoch went up from six seconds of wall time to 200 seconds. And of course, that's not so great. We were also observing some bad utilization of the available computing resources. So on my development machine, out of the available CPU time, only roughly 50% were used uh, using the differential private implementation compared to a usage of 100% on the vanilla SGD implementation. So of course, this then meant it was time for some debugging. And I will now spare you from all the pain that was digging through four layers of abstraction and just tell you what we found out about this. So it turned out that this performance, it seems to be actually somewhat unrelated to the actual per instance gradient computation. And we verified this experimentally by computing all the per instance gradients, but then instead of taking the average or summing them up and then adding different privacy and continuing, we just selected one at random, clipped it and added the private noise and continued with, with only basically one sample of all these. And that had no performance impact. So even though we still computed all the per instance gradients. So we concluded that it is actually the summation of the per instance gradients that uh, affects the performance so much. And briefly thinking about this, yeah, we need to sum over the batch, which was 128 data items with each 700 K parameters for the gradient. So that's roughly 90 million values. And that's not nothing. And also this was somewhat corroborated by the XLA debugging logs, which showed that it was spending a lot of time in actually this summing up step. But why does this happen? We were suspecting some bad memory access patterns there, which would also explain why the CPU wasn't used that well. It was, if it was um, waiting for memory, uh, for the yeah for memory to come through, uh, but that still leaves the question unanswered of why does this happen? Is it a suboptimal implementation in the XLA CPU primitives themselves, which would seem a bit odd, odd because you would think being part of TensorFlow that they would be extensively tested? Is it just a suboptimal just in time compilation on part of JAX and the, how it change the primitive uh, chains the primitives? and orders them and pass the data in between. And yeah, does the same stuff happen on GPU? So the development machine I was working on didn't have a GPU. So my first tests were all on CPU. So th these are all our unanswered questions. And then at this step point, we kind of took a break and realized, hey, this is exactly the kind of performance issue that the NVIDIA AI Technology Center can help us with. So we kind of bundled this up at this point and yeah, asked NVIDIA to come help us here. So this is also now in the presentation, the point where I pass the ball on to Nikki, who can tell you what he did with this. Great, thanks very much, Lucas. Yeah, brilliant stuff. All right, can you see it's okay? I guess so. So right, uh, yeah, in my section of the presentation, I will focus on what we did actually to fix the performance in the code base, as well as then some further optimization work that we did to make the code even faster. And here's just to summarize the baseline. So Lucas already mentioned this, so that initial implementation was bound to suffer from very poor performance relative to standard learning and its causes remained unclear. So that's why we decided to approach this project very pragmatically. So simply just wanted to reproduce the performance issues and see if they happen on GPUs. And second, to profile the code to identify the bottlenecks. So what are the exact causes that cause these performance degradation? And then finally, to come up with a strategy to tackle these bottlenecks. So this was basically the statement of work for the NVIDIA AI Technology Center project. So as I was reproducing Lucas's tests on GPUs, and first of all, I saw exactly the same poor performance. But then I realized that in my case, the problem was that JAX falls back to CPU backend, and it does it so silently. If there's any, anything wrong with the GPU, 
backend, well, GPU environments. So below I listed all the steps that I had to do to enable actually GPU acceleration with the code base. So first of all, I work with containerized environments. So as a first step, I simply just pulled the latest PyTorch container from the NVIDIA GPU cloud because it kind of ensures that everything QW related works. Then inside the container, I first install JAX, but here it's important that you give JAX the correct CUDA version as well as Python version and then platform. If you just do pip install JAX, it wouldn't enable GPU acceleration. Same goes for NumPyro. So you need to first clone it from GitHub, the master branch, and install it using that instead of just doing pip install NumPyro. Otherwise, it wouldn't be GPU accelerated. So that should do it for the environment. But there's one more caveat, and I kind of tried to demonstrate it with these last three bullets. So inside Python, if I import JAX we can, and then print the backend that it's using, it returns GPU. However, if I first import JAX and then NumPyro, it reverts back to CPU backend. So for the NumPyro, I need to explicitly tell that it sets the platform to GPU backend. So it can be often the case that you're run, you think that you're running on GPUs when in fact you're not. So if there's anything wrong with these steps, and even if you explicitly tell it to use GPUs, it might revert back to CPUs and it does sit so silently. So it turns out by running on GPUs and using a clean containerized environment just fix the performance completely and it became like 100x faster. And I will show you all the benchmark numbers later on in the presentation. So now that the large performance gap was fixed, then we proceeded with further optimization and we kind of identified the subsampler to be the lowest hanging fruit. And this random subsampler is required when we use privacy amplification as it requires uniform sampling probability. So for sample to be included in a batch needs to have constant probability. And previously, the previous subsampler approach was based on something called fishy yates shuffle. And that's inherently a sequential algorithm. So it's very ill-suited for GPU acceleration. So now we have replaced it with a new implementation that is based on something called Bicel Cypher, which is all parallel bitwise operation. So it's really fast on GPUs. And we got this idea from my colleagues at NVIDIA. So we are, our implementation is based on work by Stokes and Mitchell from University of Waikato and NVIDIA. And their original paper on shuffling on GPUs with bijective functions is currently under review. We base our implementation for that to their work. Then on the right, you can see a schematic of the Feistel network. And here you can see this F function. So if you select F to be a cryptographic random function, then it's been proven that a three block Feistel network becomes a good pseudo random permutation generator. So basically what it does, it's a bijection from a set, a finite set containing in a power of two number of elements. And because it's a permutation, it's a bijection. So each input only maps to a unique output. But the caveat is that it requires the number of elements in your set to be a power of two. And if I just walk you through it, so it works that it in, takes in an integer, then you split the, its bits to left half and right half. Then the bits from the left half go directly to bitwise XR. Then the right bits go to this random function, which uh, takes in a random key as well. And then it goes as the other half to the bitwise XR. And then it just cascades onwards. So the result from the XR goes to the next random function and the original right bits go directly to the XOR. And with this, you can create pseudo random permutations or sets with number of elements of power of two. So obviously then we needed to generalize that and the original paper already also addressed this. So we should consider a case where the number of elements is not the power of two. And it turns out that you can use it just iteratively. 
So you can simply apply the Feistel method for each of your inputs until they obtain a result that is smaller than n. So it is kind of summarized over here, this function. So you start with a sequence of integers, then you hit all the elements in that array with the Feistel network. And if it returns values that are smaller than your n, you freeze those values. If they're larger than n or equals to n, then you just continue with the Feistel network. And Lucas and I have been working on some mathematical proofs that it proves that it produces unique outputs as well as it converges values that are smaller than n, but we will go through them in these presentations. I'd rather show you an example that hopefully gives you an idea why this works as a pseudo-random permutation generator. So let's start with an array with a length of five. So all the elements go from zero to four, obviously. And n is not now not a power of two. Then here I just we have to remember that Feistel network creates permutations for only for sets that have power power of two number of elements. So it basically get, creates a bijection from these numbers to these numbers. So in practice, we don't have to compute these numbers that fall on that are over the maximum value in our original array, but you need to be aware of that, that they are in the set as well. So as a first step, we just insert all these integers to the Feistel network and it gives us random, a new array. But in this case, we can see now that there's this six and seven that are uh, larger than the maximum value in our original array. So that's why you need to repeat the process. So insert this first entry and the third entry to the Feistel network again. And then we can see that we have to remember that it's bijective function, the Feistel network for a single key. So it defines a mapping from these numbers to these numbers. So here we can see that if we insert six to the Feistel network again, it needs to become five and seven must become one. So that happens with the second iteration of them. Unfortunately, five is still over uh, larger than the maximum value in our original array. So we need to insert it again to the Feistel network and looking from the bijective operator, now five become, becomes four. And then we end up with an array that is random permutation of the original array. And Lucas and I have also worked on some further Nazi analysis of this method. And it turns out that in 94% of the cases, we should see no more than five failures. So six iterations in total for this process. And here's an implementation, how we implemented this in JAX. So here's that function. It takes in a random key, then it takes in the data set where you kind of want to draw the random samples and n would be just your batch size. It's just some constant values. For example, this a would be now the number of layers in the Feistel network and seed needs to create seeds for each of the layers in the Feistel network. Then the actual Feistel network is defined here with the permu 32. So the bits variable would be just closest power of two that is larger than the number of elements in your data set. This hash function would be now the cryptographic random function. These are just some masking values, how to split the bits. And here's just a loop that loops over all the layers in your Feistel network. So masking the upper bits, lower bits, then the hash function, bitwise XOR, and then it returns a position. And then here, finally, we can see that we have a parallel while loop. So it basically iterates just the Feistel network over and over again until all the positions in the original array converge to value that is smaller than the number of elements in our original data set. And here's just a simple example how we tested it. So we defined a batch size of 256, the number of samples, so where we want to draw the samples is 1 million, then we did 20,000 draws from that data set using the batch size of 256. And then we just 
kept track of certain variables. So are there any duplicates and how many times each index is visited, et cetera. And then we also compare it with just non random choice, which should do the same thing. And we also tested it against the uniform normal distribution chi-square test. This was just mainly for debugging purposes. But we did extensive testing and it should work just as well as using just numpy random choice. Then finally, moving on to the benchmarks. So again, these numbers are for the variational autoencoder using the MNIST dataset and Lucas already described this case. And the performance number that he saw was six seconds for the standard learning and 200 seconds for differential private learning. And these numbers are for per epoch. So just by using GPU acceleration and the clean containerized environment, these numbers went down quite a bit. So the standard training was now 0.27 per epoch and differential private training was 0.76 per epoch. So that's obviously a massive speed up factors there. But what's the exciting results in this case is that the performance hit that you now have to take from differential privacy is only 2.8x, whereas it was 33x in the previous version. Then here we have another table that shows the performance numbers when we enable the privacy amplification by subsampling. And the first number is here for the Fisher Yates based permutation generator. And we can see that if we use that, the performance hit we take is 2.5x if we enable privacy amplification by subsampling. But if we use the newly implemented Feister network, then the performance hit is only 4%. So you get basically the privacy amplification for free or yeah, 4% overhead. So this is very exciting results. Yeah, finally, to conclude, so a starting point was that Lucas already had a brilliant implementation of differential private STG, but it wasn't performing very well. So we managed to fix the performance issues related to the code base. And the exciting result was that we managed to significantly reduce the differential privacy overhead just by using GPUs and clean containerized environment. Then we additionally managed to speed up the code by introducing this new Feister cipher based subsampler that is based on earlier work by Stokes and Mitchell. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Thanks very much. Happy to take any questions. Thank you. It was very interesting. So, do we have some questions from the audience? Well, while, while the others are then gathering their thoughts and, and forming the questions, so I can start. So, so you are saying that, that, that there is a kind of, you, you already studied the extension uh, of the subsampling method to more general setting, but what kind of, kind of like restrictions do the more general settings have? Or can, can you see that in the future that can be used for any kind of uh, set, learning settings? Right, yeah, yeah, I actually didn't comment that one point. So actually the, what we refer to this with this point it was that the original Feistel cipher based permutation generator, it only works for sets where the number of elements is a power of two. So here we refer to generalized Feistel cipher to be where it works for arbitrary sized data sets, basically. But the original paper by Stokes and Mitchell already addresses this thing as well, but yeah, we also then implement it in such a way that it works for arbitrary data set sizes, basically. Okay. But yeah, it has a wide range of application. This is just a quite nice way of using methods from, from cryptography to use it as a pseudo random permutation generator to draw random samples from your data set. So it's quite, quite nice way of doing things. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So do we have other questions from the audience then? I don't see any hands raising. Okay. 
can always email us as well. That's yeah, yeah. As, as, as we still have some some time, so could you also, Nikki, then then say a few words about the the cooperation that you do with with different research organizations? So, so this was really interesting cooperation that you did for for the project. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. So this. This project with Lucas and Antti, this was one of the pilot projects that we did. So, but since then I had multiple projects with different researchers from the University of Helsinki and Aalto. Hopefully get a few projects with uh, VTT as well. So, yeah, regarding the other projects, there's something about natu natural language processing and there's with Yak Lettings Group some uh, work on how to port the style game to, to multi-GPU environments. So I guess the main point that I would like to make is not that if we want, you want to do collaboration with us, we do not want to overtake your research, but we want to just provide you some uh, technologies that allows you to do your research more efficiently. So for in this case, it would be just enable basically GPU acceleration and then provide this with Python cipher thing. So hopefully that gives some context to this kind of collaborative project. Yeah. Thank you. So if no other questions arise. So then I, I would like to again thank you a lot, Nikki and, and Lucas, for the interesting presentation. And, and then, of course, I, I will welcome everyone again to join us next week. So next week we will have Leo Lahti talking about probabilistic machine learning in human mi microbiome research. So, so see you all again next week. Thank you.